participants to join in to this webinar. In fact, could be good morning and good afternoon for some of our alumni who are international and also all interstate as well. So just a few more minutes, I can see these participants, the numbers are growing. All right, let me start off the session. Uh, so my name is Udi Vijayvardhana. I'm the Alumni Engagement Manager for the Faculty of Science. My long name is Udeshka Vijayvardhana, so if you see emails from that name, that's still me. Um, look, uh, before we kick off, let me acknowledge the traditional owners of our land and pay respects to the elders uh, past and present. So, a big welcome to our alumni, both local and international, who are joining us today, and also other members. Um, now, as you know, we are doing this webinar series for Monash Science, um, essentially to bring the latest research that we do in the Faculty of Science. And as a, as a part of it, we want the alumni to continue their ongoing learning through the Faculty of Science. And also we'd want you to share the and be up to date with the newest research we do here. So it's our second webinar for 2021 and presented to you by the School of Biology. Um, the format for this today's event is that we'll have a half an hour session from Dr. Matt Piper. And then we have about 15 to 20 minute Q&A session at the end. Um, what I will ask you is to actually put your Q&As at the uh, bottom toolbar of your Zoom screen and uh, after the presentation from Matt Piper, we will you know, answer as many questions as you can within that 15-20 minutes at the end of the session. So, uh, as you know, the School of Biology is presented it today. It's been a very popular topic, age and diet. Everyone wants to know what diet is the key to, you know, remain young. We have about 350 registrants for this event. So really, really excited. Um, let me introduce you to our moderator for this evening, Professor Craig White. Craig, if you want to turn on your uh, camera and just say hello. There he is. Hi, hello, everyone. Hello, hello. So Craig's our head of school for biology, and he will be the MC for tonight. Um, look, uh, I mean, just a bit of background about Craig. I've been asking him. He didn't want to share much, but I finally gave in. So I've got a few details about him. So uh, Craig's an evolutionary uh, uh, physiologist. Uh, essentially, he's interested in describing the um, uh, understanding about the biological evolution and the cause and effect of certain evolutions in animals. Um, he is the uh, head of school for biology for about a year now and previous to that Craig's actually our associate dean of research for the whole of faculty of science and um, I think he has been a lecturer in the uh, University of Queensland and pr prior to that uh, been working in University of Birmingham for some time too. So Craig's from South Australia and he's earned his PhD from uh, University of Adelaide. Uh, look, in fact, I was joking with Craig the other day saying that you must be one of the youngest professors I've ever met, which is, you know, uh, a true compliment to his achievements in his, uh, his research area. And to a testament to that is the uh, President's Medal that he's won for animal biology and for the, from the Society of Experimental Biology, and he's also been awarded the QE2 and Future Fellowships from the Australian Research Council. So, uh, Craig, I'll leave the session with you, and over to you now. 
Thanks very much, Udi. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us. This is at this point in the, the webinar, I might usually talk about the sort of things that um, a school of biological sciences does. So we study the evolution of plants, animals, bacteria, yeast. Um, we study ecology, the consequences of environmental change for species and the ecosystems that they occupy, conservation planning, environmental restoration, right through to therapies for cardiovascular and neuromuscular disease. We do this in collaboration with colleagues from other faculties within the university, other universities across the world, spanning science, medicine, IT and engineering. And the, the sort of the collaborative approach we take to science is really exemplified by a recently awarded um, Australian Research Council Special Research Initiative, Securing Australia's Environmental Future, which is led by Professor Stephen Chown, who's a member of biological sciences and a former head of the School of Biological Sciences, and that spans fundamental science through to policy. But all of what I've just said is really a, a long-winded way of saying that solving the challenges of our age is really about bringing people together um, to work together on difficult problems. And I wanna just say a little bit about that before I hand over to the main event for Matt. Um, so I've been the head of biological sciences for a bit over sort of seven months now. And one of the first things I did when I became the head of school was meet everyone on Zoom because we were all in lockdown at that time. And through that period, I was, I was really struck by one of the most common themes I heard from the members of the school was not to tell me how difficult things were, even though they were, and not to tell me about the challenges they were facing, even though the challenges we were all facing were challenging. Everyone went out of their way to tell me about how their colleagues had helped them. And so it's, it's really struck me coming into this role about the community um, that I'm privileged to be able to be a part of. And that community really extends to our students and graduates, their families, friends, colleagues, um, anyone who ha really has an interest in speaking with us, helping us or hearing from us. And so before I um, introduce Matt, I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We're here to hear, here to hear about Matt Piper talk about how diet affects how long we live. So Matt's a senior lecturer in School of Biological Sciences and he heads the Nutritional Physiology and Aging Research Group. His research focuses on the effects of diet on aging, in particular the role of protein and the ways in which it modifies health through the life course. He obtained his PhD in biochemistry and genetics from the University of New South Wales and then moved to a postdoc at the Technical Unity University of Delft in the Netherlands, where he studied fermentation technology. He then moved to University College London where he began his work on nutrition and aging. In 2010, he was awarded a Royal Society University Research Fellowship to set up his own lab at UCL. And then in 2016, he moved back to Australia on an ARC Future, Fe Future Fellowship, where he established his lab here at Monash. He's been funded by the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council to work on the role of diet in health and disease. And it's knowledge in these areas that will really help us to understand how nutrient balance can be employed to enhance adult health, appetite, and longevity. And with that, I will hand over to Matt to, to tell us how we can all live a bit longer. Thanks, Matt. Okay, thanks, Greg. I should appear at this point. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Uh, look, let me uh, reiterate uh, Craig and Udi's welcome, and thank you all for spending your evening listening to me talk about diet and aging. So the title here is, is your diet affecting how long you live? And I think the short answer is almost certainly, but if you stick with me for 30 minutes, I'm gonna fill in some more details there. Okay. I think if we think about healthy aging, uh, we have certain images in our mind, right? So for me, it, um, this man comes to mind. This, name's, this guy is called Dick Bavetta. He was uh, a referee in the NBA. I'm a big fan of basketball. And he was in regular service and never missed a game uh, that he was rostered on to officiate for 40 years. Uh, and during that time, uh, he, he refereed uh, thousands of matches and he only retired at the age of 75. He's now 82 and he's living a happy life in retirement. So this is one form of healthy aging. But the other form of aging that we all know about, where we don't often show pictures about, uh, is this one, right? So we all know people who do all the wrong things. Um, they smoke, uh, they might drink heavily, they've been through, this woman's lived through two world wars, and so the stress and the um, external environment that she's had 
are not normally conducive to a long life, and yet she's lived to the age of 100, as we can see. And this really exemplifies the two aspects that are large influences over the way we age, both the genes and the environment in which we live. And I'm going to cover a little bit of information about both of those things during the next half hour. So I think it's worth starting, if we're going to talk about aging, to ask the question, why should we study aging? Well, one really good reason that always comes to mind for me is because we're getting older, right? So we're all interested in this. But we're getting older, not only individually, but we're actually getting older uh, as a population. And what I'm showing you here in this graph is the life expectancy that every individual has at birth uh, over on the x-axis here, the year at birth of individuals. And each one of these colored series here represents a different nation from around the world. And what you can see for as long as records have been recorded uh, is that there's been an inexorable increase in life expectancy at birth for pretty much every nation around the world. There's dips here and there, largely due to wars often, uh, but overall we're seeing a genuine increase in life expectancy at birth for individuals as they've been born over time. What that means for us living in Australia, if you were born in 1890, your life expectancy at birth would have been left less than 50 years. Right now, or very close to right now, it's 83 years. And that's for males and females combined. So if you're a female, you can actually expect to live a little bit longer if you're born in 2018. There's something other else that's a feature about this graph that I like to look at, which is if you take the slope of the line through the record holding nation at any one in point of time over the last 100 years, you can see what's happened is we've gained in life expectancy at a rate of one year for every five years lived. So this is remarkable, right? Uh, it means that for a child born in 2018, by the time they reach 83, if that keeps going, they will have gained an extra 16 years of life expectancy. And so by that point, the whole life expectancy will actually be basically 100 years. So that's a remarkable increase, as you can see. The other good thing about that is, is that for this hour that you're experiencing right now, you will get 12 minutes of that back because your life expectancy will increase by that amount during that time. The other thing about this is that it's not showing any signs of leveling off. And there's a lot of discussion about this in the literature. But one way uh, you could think about this is that we don't actually know what the upper limit to human life expectancy is at the moment. Okay. So this is obviously a triumph of modern medicine and we say well this is great you know all of the discoveries we've made about you know uh, reducing child mortality washing hands vaccinations wearing seat belts these are all great they've largely contributed to the increase in life expectancy what it does though is as we live longer and longer it introduces another new problem for us in biomedical sciences and that is that we start now to experiencing the diseases of aging Right, so we're now starting to suffer and die from another group of diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, uh, and type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. All of these diseases increase as we get older. In fact, you could say that the common underlying risk factor for all of these diseases is aging itself. And that should influence the way we think about the way we do our biomedical research. The current strategy is uh, that we each adopt one of these diseases um, and we institute a research area based on each one of those diseases individually for the purpose of trying to come up with a treatment for each one of these diseases. But if aging is the common underlying risk factor for all of these diseases, perhaps we should be taking a different approach. Perhaps we should consider them all symptoms of one common underlying problem, and that's aging itself. And so if we can think about ways of getting to understand what aging is and why it occurs and how we might treat aging, then maybe we've got a way of protecting people against all of these aging related diseases simultaneously. All right, so I've really taken off there and gone straight for the, you know, the, the, the hybrid. I'm going to come down a little bit back to earth and ask the question, um, do we actually know anything about aging? And is this at all feasible? I've extrapolated from basically two relationships for so far. So I'm now going to get into a little bit about the detail of what we think causes aging, how this has been informed by the evolutionary theory, what the evidence is that this might actually be the case before I move on to stuff about diet. 
Okay, so what causes aging? Well, one way of thinking about aging, uh, and this is in fact, uh, it's a really intuitive way to think about aging, and it's central to most of the mechanistic theories about why aging or how aging occurs, is that perhaps we just wear out. Okay, so if you live long enough, uh, you'll accrue mechanical damage, you'll accrue chemical damage just by living and as a byproduct of aerobic metabolism. Uh, and perhaps just like this car, it ends up leading to a point of catastrophic failure and the system just can no longer cope anymore. All right, so um, perhaps aging is caused by accumulated damage. One of the major differences, just one of them, between us and this car is that we have our own built-in repair mechanisms into our system, right? So we have wound healing mechanisms, we have DNA repair mechanisms, we have proofreading mechanisms, all these things we have inside us. And these are encoded by the genes that we have as well. And each of these genes have different capabilities and the rate at which we accrue damage and the capability to repair that damage uh, varies um, and responds to uh, evolutionary pressure. And the evidence for that uh, we can see is by the fact that different species have different intrinsic maxima to their lifespans. And I'm showing you just three here. We have our little mouse that lives for about three years uh, and this example of an Arctic shark, there was a paper a couple of years ago about this that showed the predicted that its life expectancy was somewhere in the range of between 300 and 500 years. It's difficult to estimate these things when you don't have 300 years or much visibility over what they do. But not just this enormous range, uh, there are some organisms that are thought to be immortal. So this jellyfish, uh, the clue's in the name, it's called the immortal jellyfish. Uh, and this one, uh, this is a marine hydra. These are classically cited as organisms that show no signs of senescence when we bring them into the lab and study them. And so this has presented a kind of a paradox to evolutionary biologists, right? Because if genes are controlling our ability um, to live, our ability to repair damage, and yet they've evolved to different extents um, to determine lifespan across different lineages, why is it that in some cases you can have this extreme longevity in complex systems and in other cases evolution has selected for very short lifespans and so the onset of aging coming very shortly right because evolution really should be working to the benefit of all things right so we in in an ideal sense what you would expect is you know a rapidly reproducing organism that goes on forever and reproduces and takes over the world right so surely evolution be, should be selecting for that and so I pose this question here, since aging is detrimental, how on earth could evolution have let this happen? Well, the answer to this question uh, was generated by well, many people, I should say, but developed over time. But during the middle of the last century, these three uh, distinguished looking gentlemen contributed uh, quite significantly to the proposed answer to this question that's now generally accepted. And the answer is that Evolution doesn't act on aging itself, but it actually acts on something else, and that something else causes aging to happen. And so it's an inadvertent selection for aging is how aging could evolve. And the key insight that they generated was by recognizing that late onset diseases uh, that are genetically inherited, like Huntington's disease, can be passed from father to son before their onset. And so a father um, can suffer from, uh, can have the genes that will cause him to have Huntington's disease, but inadvertently pass them on to the next generation before the onset of that disease. And so you can see then how late acting detrimental mutations can escape the force of natural selection because they're passed on before the um, holder actually has, uh, knows they've got it or it has any consequence for the reproductive capacity of that individual. And one step further than that, you could actually dream up a scenario whereby selection for genes that make you better at reproduction, if they also cause aging, may actually be selected for. And I'll uh, try and illustrate what I'm saying there with this uh, super technical graph that I've generated. Uh, so this idea here is called antagonistic pleiotropy. Okay, so we've got organisms and their age on the x-axis here. And on the y-axis, I've put functional vigor or um, you know, some kind of measure of fitness, I guess you'd put. And what we've got is, uh, these are my uh, twin babies. 
seven years ago before they uh, themselves were far less antagonistic towards each other. Uh, but they were very quiet and they were very lovely, but they weren't very uh, functionally vigorous. Like we, it's not as if we left them alone, they could cope for very long. And so there's a strong evolutionary selection pressure for organisms to grow up to the age at which they're able to pass on their genes to the next generation. Now, what if the genes that were involved in selection here that enhanced the process of growing up to being uh, that uh, reproductive age actually were the same genes that caused the detrimental effect that led to aging and lack of function that occurs with aging. Um, Ian, if you're watching, I'm sorry, you're a good sport. Okay, so if that's the case, then the normal function of these genes should be to select for the benefits that lead up to evolutionary fitness peak, uh, but also cause aging itself. And if that's the case, then you should be able to mutate those genes um, and cause an extension of lifespan or a delay in aging, right? So their normal function is to cause aging. So if you mutate them, they should delay aging. And some 30 years ago now, um, I, I remember this, uh, I'm gonna date myself, I remember this, um, the first description of a single gene mutation or the first characterization of a single gene mutation that could extend lifespan was reported in worms. So this is the nematode worm C. elegans. And what was reported by Cynthia Kenyon and her group was that when they mutated the worms, they lived incredibly long. A gene in the worms, they lived for a long time. And what I'm showing you here is the survival curve. You might be familiar with it, but just in case, we have time or, or lifespan potential of the organism on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have the proportion of the population that's alive. And so what you can see is that the population starts at 100% alive and then inexorably over time, you sort of lead to the senescence that leads to death and that's characteristic of aging. And these three lines here represent the control conditions. While this long lived one out here is mutated in one single gene and yet it lives more than twice as long as all of the controls in this particular experiment. Now, eight years later than that, uh, in the lab actually that I went to work in at UCL, they described another single gene mutation, this time in the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, that could extend lifespan as well. And so here, what I'm showing you here is the control in the open symbols here and the mutants out here in the field symbols. And again, we have a single gene mutation that could extend lifespan of these organisms. And only a couple of years after that, the first single gene mutation to extend lifespan in mice was also reported. And in this case, you can see controls coming down shorter lived than these longer lived mutant individuals. So there's a few remarkable things here. First of all, people thought um, for a long time that this was just a peculiarity of worms, uh, but it turns out not to be. You can mutate genes in all of these organisms and extend lifespan. Uh, the other significant thing about it was that actually, as you can see in by I've written here, is these mutations all fell in the same molecular signaling pathway, and that's the insulin signaling pathway. The other feature about these animals is that not only were they were long lived, but they were actually small, they had delayed development, and they, had, they were subfertile. So they gained the benefit of this longevity by mutating a gene that brought them a cost to all the early life traits that would improve their fitness. Okay, so this conforms exactly to that idea of antagonistic pleiotropy, where you should have a gene that causes benefits to early life health but cause aging, then when we mutate them, they might extend lifespan or delay aging, but cause a cost to early life fitness. And that's exactly what was observed in this case. And the third really remarkable thing that I wanna point out here, of course, is that we've got the same gene mutation in the same signaling pathway in worms, in flies and mice. So the evolutionary distance this, this spans gives it a pretty good chance that mutations in this gene may also um, impact on the lifespan of humans as well. And in fact, genome-wide association studies involving super centenarians, so these people who live beyond 110 years, have pinpointed mutations in one of the genes involved in insulin signaling, the FOXA gene, it's a transcription factor involved in insulin signaling, that when mutated may actually, although we don't know, it's a, an association study, may actually be involved in modulating the aging process in humans as well. So what's insulin signaling do? Well, I'm, I'm not gonna go into a great deal of depth here, but I just wanna um, outline it so that we're all clear where, what's going on. 
is that in our um, body, of course, we've got organs and in those organs, they're made up of cells. Uh, and in each of those cells, we have some kind of way of communicating the nutritional status of the organism into the cell to manipulate what goes on inside that cell. So in the case of insulin signaling, uh, it responds to nutrition. The pancreas it, uh, secretes insulin and this circulates throughout the body. And on different cells in the body, we have an insulin receptor. So the insulin and uh, in those other models, IGF as well, insulin-like growth factor, uh, impact on the cells and they initiate a molecular signaling program inside cells of the body, both to do with uh, nutrient storage, but also uh, to initiate anabolic programs. So programs associated with growth and reproduction. So now you can imagine uh, a scenario where how, when you knock those down, you delay growth, you have a subfertile animal. So the big question then comes in is, how is this causing lifespan extension? And that's something we don't know. So at about the same time, and this is uh, really where my work comes into it, uh, is that we started to think more about how nutrition might be involved in this process. <clears throat> and what I've just said, and what we already know, is that insulin signaling and other nutrient signaling pathways are in fact responding to the nutritional status of the organism. So perhaps we can replicate this effect by manipulating the nutritional status of the organism, not just by manipulating the genes in that organism. And if we look back through the um, history of publications on how diet affects lifespan, we can trace it back to uh, probably the most well-recognized well original paper in this area, published by Clive McKay in 1935, in which he had two populations of rats. And he'd already noticed that when you deprive the rats of food to a certain extent, or you nutrient um, restrict them, you'll actually extend their developmental period so that, such that reproductive maturity and growth is delayed. And so he reasoned, well, if that bit's delayed, what if you kept going with the restriction? Maybe you just keep delaying everything and so eventually offset lifespan, uh, offset length of life in the end and have a long-lived individual. And over on the left here, this is actually an original panel from the paper. What you can see is the population of animals that he fed freely, so they had free access to food, and their weight gain profile over time on the x-axis. So you can see the mass of the animals accumulated rapidly and they adopted a high body weight or, that was maintained throughout their lives in this particular case. The second group of animals he took, and the reason why there are two lines here is because he had males and females. The second groups of animals he took, he fed a restricted diet. And the way he did was he gave them a certain amount of food and he watched them and they, that was enough to maintain them at a certain body weight for a certain period of time. So you can see the little plateaus here. And then the report says in the paper, when they started to fail, I'm not quite exactly sure what that meant, he gave them their allocation plus a bit more. And so you can see that you got a little step up here as they gained a bit more weight and then they were plateaued again. And then again, he gave them a bit more and so on. But overall, their diet restricted for their body weight increase over time for their entire lives. And what you can already see over on the right here is that those that were fed ad libitum, so they had free access to food, had a relatively shorter lifespan than those that were fed a diet restricted uh, uh, regime throughout their life. And so this is diet restricted males being longer lived than those on the ad libitum diet. And since that time, uh, 85 years ago, there's been numerous reports on dozens of different organisms in which some degree of diet restriction experiment has been done and shown to extend, if not the lifespan of the organism, the health span or the healthy lifespan of the organism. Uh, and uh, the most recent breakthrough in this area was the report that rhesus monkeys, that, uh, well, there were two studies done simultaneously uh, and there was a bit of a race between them. And one started to report a lifespan extension, the other ones reported a health span extension. But I think at the end of the day, the consensus is that while there may have been a slight lifespan extension in these individuals, there was indeed an improvement of health in these individuals uh, as they got on throughout life. Now, given the evolutionary conservation here, this has obviously led to the promise that perhaps we can benefit from this too, right? And so there are people who commonly practice diet restriction or calorie restriction or some form of that related to intermittent feeding, not for the purpose of improving their current health necessarily, 
but for the express purpose of extending their life expectancy. And there's a group of people called cronies, C-R-O-N-I-E-S. If you're interested, you can look them up on the web. There are lots of good tips on how to formulate your diet so that you can live longer. Now, of course, we don't know whether this works or not, but these people who practice it, they claim to be experiencing the same metabolic benefits and physiological benefits that we see in the lab animals that experience chronic diet restriction throughout their lives. Uh, this man here, Dave Fisher, Fisher, is kind of the poster child for them. Uh, he's been on caloric restriction for 30 years now, and his current regime uh, is he eats for six days of the week, he fasts for one day, and on average, he consumes 1,700 kilocalories per day. And this is well below the recommended amount for males. Uh, uh, the result is that he is extremely lean, as you would imagine. He has 6% body fat. He's relatively light for his height, has a very low BMI. And I'll leave it up to you to judge whether he looks good for a 61-year-old. In this overexposed photo, I should say, I, can see, I think he looks pretty good. But there's all sorts of downsides to this. The degree of restriction that needs to be engaged in uh, to produce this effect may be far beyond what we're prepared to sacrifice, right? So I've already told you that the poor mice or the rats that were put on that regime, they suffered from slowed growth. They were subfertile again. And yet they were longer lived, so happier, but no, they might be uh, miserable, but lived longer. And Dave Fisher himself even reports that uh, there was a downside to this and that for the first five years, at least, he felt hungry. So we become interested in the dietary components that might be important for dictating the lifespan outcomes, because if we can get at what it is about the diet that's important for this effect, we may be able to avoid some of the costs and at the very least avoid this being hungry for five years cost. Right, so now I'm going to switch over slightly to the stuff to work what we've been doing and show you a little bit of new data. I've been talking about a lot about old data um, now for something a little bit new. Okay, so my lab, as Craig introduced, we work on nutritional physiology and aging. And what does that mean? Well, it means we basically modify the diet in ways that we hope will improve health and fight disease. And we're particularly interested in those diet modifications in a very precise way so that will give us the best insight into what the molecular mechanisms that underpin the changes in physiology so that then we can get a better understanding of what's going on inside the organism as they feed and so understand in a more complete sense how diet is affecting physiology which ultimately affects lifespan and aging and now there's always a slightly awkward point in the conversation where I've been having this conversation now with someone. I tell them what they do and I explain all about the evolution of aging and how exciting it is and how we can all live forever. And you know what I mean? Um, and then I tell them, well, we don't actually work with humans. Uh, we work with fruit flies. So I feel like uh, there's an important moment here now where I need to justify what it is that why we do and why we do this work with flies. So flies are a great model organism to work on. If you did undergraduate science and you did a genetics degree, no doubt you would have experienced Drosophila melanogaster in the lab in some form. That may have actually put you off them for life. And I came to flies actually during my postdoc. So I didn't have that traumatic undergraduate experience that you might have had. But I can tell you as a model organism for doing experimental science with, they are fantastic to work with. And I'll give you a couple of reasons. But one is that genetically, they are actually very similar to humans. Uh, there's a number that goes around often that's quoted that says that, you know, flies contain orthologs or homologs of 70% of the human disease causing genes. So there's a great scope for studying human disease and physiology by studying flies. Another important one for what I'm talking about is that we've developed uh, a synthetic diet for them in which we can manipulate single nutrients in a very precise way. So then now we've got good control over their um, genetics uh, because there's a long established history of using flies for genetic research. We've got good handle on their diet. Now we can start to ask how dietary manipulations affect the genes of the flies and affect their physiology and lifespan. Another key thing about flies is they don't live that very long, right? So if you're going to study aging, you want something that's relatively short lived. And the flies in our lab live for somewhere around 70, 80, 90 days at the most. And the other thing is that you can see they're incredibly small. Uh, this is obviously not life size. This is um, a massive um, magnification of one, but you can see here in this glass vial here uh, that we keep dozens of flies. 
and they live on this agar gelled medium that's pretty cheap to make. Uh, and so we can keep them for a long time in these situations and study iterations of diet change and how it affects their lifespan. Okay, key question, does diet restriction extend the lifespan of flies? And the answer is yes, it does. And this is something that was published quite some time ago now. Uh, so here we have our fully fed animals on their nutrient rich diet. Uh, and you can see that when we diet restrict them by approximately 50%, and the way we do that is we just dilute the nutrients in the food, uh, we get these diet restricted longer lived animals. And I guess if we're going to average it out over all sorts of interventions and all sorts of treatments, we can expect an increase in lifespan of somewhere in the range of 20% if we take that median point here and measure it against the two lines. One of the discoveries that we made when we very first started doing this work was that when we just restricted the protein component alone, we could actually reproduce the effects of diet restriction altogether. Okay. So this was work, as you can see here now, it was published about 15 years ago. And what we did was we held all the nutrients in the diet constant, and then we restricted individual ones uh, in turn. And what we found is that the major contributor to this dietary restriction effect was in fact the dilution of protein on its own. So that's great. We've gotten closer to understanding how diet affects lifespan, uh, but it still comes at a cost. And uh, I mean, we don't know how hungry the flies actually are. We can't tell that. But what we can tell is if they're slow growing and subfertile. And so they experience those costs, early life fitness costs again, uh, while they gain the late life, uh, late, late life health benefits. So you can see here that while these animals are fully fed, they may be short lived, but they have extremely high levels of reproductive output. And in this case, we're measuring egg laying in female flies. And so we have high reproduction and relatively short lifespan. Uh, and for those that live longer, they gain the benefit of longevity, but they um, pay the price in terms of their early life fitness. And so they have a much lower level of reproductive output. And if we were to maintain them on them throughout the growth period, they'd also be delayed and small animals. And so we uh, started to investigate what it was about the protein content that was important for this effect to try and get a bit more detail on the physiological consequences. Uh, so this is our uh, food pyramid. This is probably a bit outdated now um, since it recommends such a strong intake of meat. But uh, the major source of protein we know is meat and legumes for us in our diets. Well, for flies, it's yeast. Uh, but protein isn't just one thing, right? We all, we all know uh, that protein is made up of amino acids. It's a string of amino acids, and there are 20 protein coding amino acids. And for different types of protein, they contain different relative proportions of these amino acids. And so that um, brings up the possibility that um, flies or organisms could experience different proportions of amino acids in addition to different amounts of protein in their diet. And so we started to get into the question of what does different proportions of amino acids do to the lifespan of the animals. I'm going to switch now just to the way I'm presenting my data, just so I can present a little bit more on the one slide here. And what I'm showing you here is um, those same data as I showed two slides ago. So uh, it's this, but um, in this form. And what you can see here is I've got our fully fed or high food, high protein flies with the relatively short lifespan. And then when we dilute the food, we get our longer lived individuals, our diet restricted or protein restricted animals are longer lived. So that's what the red dots mean. That's that lifespan curve collapsed down just to the mean. Uh, the other data here is the reproductive output of the animals, and you can see that we've got the inverse relationship between lifespan and reproduction. So our high food animals with high reproduction, our low food animals with long lifespan, but lower levels of reproduction. Now I'm going to show you what happened when we manipulate the protein quality in the diet. So that's the amino acid proportions, while also changing the protein amount in the diet. Okay, so now we've got our different quality protein, which I'm calling higher quality protein. Um, and I'm not going to explain that right now, but I can afterwards if you're interested. Our higher quality protein that we're giving the flies at the same levels as what we're doing over here. So either at the fully fed level where they're supposed to be highly fecund or at the restricted level where we see the longevity in these individuals. And what we found was that lifespan still responded in exactly the same way to the quantity of protein in the diet. We still got relatively short-lived animals on the high food conditions, the high protein conditions, 
And that was extended when we diluted the protein in the diet. But what was very different here was the reproductive output. So the early life fitness enhancement was seen. And what we saw was that actually the fully fed animals showed no sign of compromise when we diluted the protein content down in terms of their reproductive output. And so those animals on a low concentration of protein, high quality protein, actually laid just as many eggs as those on the high protein diet. And so in this particular case here now, we found this unusual scenario where the animals are both long lived and benefiting from all of those um, high levels of early life fitness. So when we do our assays on their growth, they are rapidly growing as equally as rapidly growing as those that are fully fed. They lay equally as many eggs, so they have high levels of reproduction and they're long lived simultaneously. And this is important because it now gives us direction for our future research, which is ongoing now, and that's basically where we're up to, in that it shows us that protein quality is important for very strong, has very strong influence over the amount of reproductive output and the growth, um, growth related traits of the animal. And so we can study that separately from the lifespan determining outputs, uh, which in this case is the amount of protein in the diet. And that's important because that mechanistic separation means it should be possible with an extremely refined diet to optimize both simultaneously. But what actually happens, of course, is that we adopt diets um, based on things other than their long-term benefit. Um, and one of the things that we adopt diets for is weight loss in the short term or um, uh, for growth for bodybuilders, for instance. And one of the trends that's been going on there is extremely high proportion of protein in the diet. And I should say that when we study that in the lab for the flies, I've told you that that's actually the, the diet that leads to one of the shorter lifespans that we get in the, in the lab. But this is also true for mice. And so both for flies and mice, the relative proportion of protein in the diet uh, is a good predictor of how long the animals will live, where high protein diets lead to shorter lifespan and lower protein diets lead to longer lifespan outcomes. Okay, so what I said was, um, that's basically where we're up to. We're doing this work now on how protein quality affects these early life fitness traits, such as growth and reproduction, and how protein quantity affects the later life health of the animals. And so what I hope I've convinced you of is that, um, first of all, that um, flies are good for research. Uh, you should uh, look into the fly research. It's both uh, evolutionarily relevant and can give us great insights into physiology. And in this case, I hope you see that we've gained some insights into the mechanisms of aging and some ex extremely interesting way forward into how protein might affect aging. Uh, the other thing I hope to have shown you is that we can use these precise nutritional manipulations to gain insights into complex uh, physiological phenomena. Uh, and that's a, generally a theme in my lab is that we use these very small changes and perhaps expose the animals to diets that they wouldn't have experienced in their evolutionary histories. And it tends to show up new insights into what's going on inside the animal at a mechanistic level. Um, and really what, where we're going with this research is to ask, is to uh, try and answer this question from an objective definition, which is what is a balanced diet? And I hope I've encouraged you also to think when you approach this question of, uh, including the extra little bit of the question, which is for what outcome? What are you trying to achieve with this diet? So is the diet balanced for early life fitness, for growth, uh, for reproductive capacity or late life health? And there's a little bit of data that we know about how humans are affected throughout the life course by different proportions of nutrients in their diet. So I just wanna say thanks for your attention. Um, thanks for the invitation, uh, Udi and Craig for allowing me to talk about my research. And I really just now need to acknowledge a few people because um, of course I don't do any of the lab work anymore. Um, these are the wonderful people in my lab that do the work, PhD students and honor students and a postdoc. Uh, and then there's a bunch of people that I collaborate with. And I should especially point out those people um, who I've outlined in red as their Monash collaborators. Uh, Trav Johnson, who I work with on a um, project related to metabolic diseases and how we can use diet to solve metabolic diseases and very close colleagues, Kristen Murth, that I work with um, in a lot of projects in my lab, uh, Damien Dowling also, who I co-supervise students with, Carla and Adam as well. And uh, finally, thank you for your attention, and um, I appreciate that you've sat through this, and I look forward to your questions. I've taken a, a short moment to join you back there because I was thinking about questions. 
Good. Okay. I'll just take a moment to organize myself here. We've got some great questions coming in. Um, I might take a, a moderator's swing at the first one, which has come through, which is, what is the higher quality protein? <laughs> yes, good question. Um, right. So the, the higher quality protein is the, the short answer is what we what we do is we model the the protein quality so that is the amino acid proportions in the diet on the genome of the consumer that is um, receiving that diet. Um, I have a, a hang on. I'm going to do a very quick slide on this and. I hope for the people who are who stay with me, this is fun. Um, if you don't, just have a little nap. It's going to take me two minutes to go through it if I can find it. Oh, well, that's not the way to find it. Sorry, one sec. I'll tell you what. Um, oh, yeah, no, I found it now. Good. Okay. So what we do is we call this procedure exome matching right so what we do is we take a gene we translate that gene and genes uh, proteins are made up of amino acids and so then we have the amino acids that that gene encodes uh, we count up the number of each amino acid for each protein in the genome and then we find the total number of amino acids for all gene expressed genes in the genome and then we express that as a proportion relative to each other and that amino acid profile that I'm showing down here then is representative of what we call high quality protein. In other words, it's a genome based definition of what the organism encodes in its genome. And that's what we put back in the diet. Okay, thank you. I hope that was okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you talked about protein. What happens when sugars and fats are manipulated? Right. Yeah, this is a really good question. I mean, so I, I should say, like, there's some, there's always a little bit of uh, definition sort of uh, required around this because pretty much any nutrient that you eat, if you eat too much of it, it's going to be bad for you. And so there needs to be a healthy kind of range starting parameters within which we work. Uh, there are known uh, proportions of macronutrients, and that's the things that we're talking about now that influence how long humans live. And um, I, was, I have actually another little slide that I'd like to put up because I think it's quite informative. A paper that was recently published uh, in PNAS, and so this is one of the major journals that we look at, that reported uh, for dozens or hundreds of populations around the world what they eat and what the lowest mortality was for individuals on average who ate certain diets. Or perhaps the other way around of saying that is, if you ate a certain diet, what was the likelihood of dying at any one interval in time? And what you can see here is for females on the left here and males on the right, is that while the total energy intake that was associated with the lowest mortality of individuals of different ages was pretty consistent throughout life, what did change was that over time, that protein should stay relatively high, but drop later in life, and that was associated with lowest mortality carbohydrates should actually go up with age, um, surprisingly, and fat should actually come down. And so these pr um, nutritional profiles, and they're basically the same for males as females, are associated with the lowest rates of mortality amongst individuals who consume those diets at each one of these age groups. Uh, and if you're interested, this paper here has got a great summary of that. Okay. How close is this research to being able to be applied on humans or maybe other animals? Yeah, good question. Um, we hope very close. Uh, one of the, uh, yeah, so basically we, we can now with any genome, at, at least for the genome inspired protein content, let's just talk about that. Uh, we can uh, take any genome of any animal and define what high quality protein is just using a bioinformatics pipeline. And so we're very close to doing that. Uh, and we'd like to start some trials in other animals. I should say in that original publication that we published on flies and the effect of these protein qualities on reproduction, we also published something about mouse growth. And this also, we also saw an enhancement of mouse growth under the same protein quality improvements. But in terms of the macronutrient ratios and lifespan, 
Um, this really is being adopted by people right now um, for better health with older age. And so it's freely adoptable if you choose to do so. Um, but as to whether it's going to be beneficial or not, that's that one that the jury's still out on because we won't know until people have taken the diets and actually done it um, as to whether it's beneficial. But as I said in the talk, the people who are uh, undertaking these strict regimes report the benefits uh, that uh, we see in the model organisms that we maintain on these lower protein diets throughout life. Okay, so I've got two similar questions here, which I'm going to try and combine into one. Um, so this is from Seb and Nigel, thank you. Uh, you've looked at the interplay between quality and quantity of protein intake over the lifespan of flies. Mm. Um, and in the line graph comparing two groups, there was a little difference in the first third of life. Um, have you examined the effects of varying protein at early pre-reproductive compared to mm. later life stages? Yeah. And so are you able to change the diet at different times? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, right? Because the ideal scenario is that you have your um, fully fed diet for as long as possible. And then late in life, you finally switch and you gain all of the health benefits later in yep. life. Yeah. Um, so we haven't actually done that with this piece of data that we have now. And we've got some other new data related to micronutrients in which we would like to do those switch experiments, because I think that's, that's another key element. But I can tell you that back in 2015, maybe even earlier, no, even earlier than that, I'm going to have to look up. But anyway, some time ago, probably about 10 years ago, uh, there was a paper published in flies showing that if you took flies on one of those high food diets, at any point in time, if you switch them back to a low food diet, within two days, they adopted the mortality trajectory of the condition to which they went. In other words, they had no memory of the previous diet that they were on, and they had no greater chance of dying than any individual that had been maintained on that regime for the rest of their life, the, the, sorry, for their life up to that point in time. So that meant the fully fed animals had a greater risk of dying, but when you switch them to the low food condition, within two days, they adopted the mortality trajectory of the low food condition and vice versa, I should say as well. If you start eating bad, they suffer the consequences as well. Um, there's a little bit of mudding in the waters about whether that's actually translatable because a similar experiment's been done in mice. It's difficult to do because you need really large numbers of animals and they're incredibly expensive experiments to do with mice. Um, but the indication there was, while the switch from the low food to the high food condition was pretty much instantaneous and detrimental, the switch from the high to the low food condition wasn't quite so beneficial and was kind of somewhere in between. So maybe there's a bit of benefit, but there was a bit of a hangover effect. And we're not quite sure why that discrepancy between the fly data and the mouse data, but um, I think there's something maybe we can do about that, but that's for to come. So in terms of the protein quality, mm. is there a, so if you were have a human foraging, <laughs> taking food from their natural environment, um, is there a difference in protein quality between plant-based and animal-based protein? And does plant-based protein serve the same sort of purpose as, as diluting animal-based protein? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so there are some differences uh, and, and the majority of the literature usually focuses on uh, specific essential amino acids, uh, because as you, you can imagine that if you have a, a profile of amino acids that matches what you need, it perfectly you know, gives you what you need and everything's great. But if you drop down one of the essential amino acids, and these are the things that you must acquire from the diet because you can't make them yourself, then you see that all of the others become in excess. And so there's a lot of attention focusing on which, which amino acid is actually uh, restrictive in concentration in the diet and to what extent it is restrictive and how can you overcome it. And that usually gives rise to advice like about how to mix um, certain vegetables. And it looks like there are different essential amino acids that are deficient in um, plant-based products as compared with animal-based products such that on average, the quality, and by that mean how well the protein matches your needs, is generally slightly lower amongst the plant-based products than it is the animal-based products. So if for an equivalent amount of plant-based protein and animal-based protein, the quality is slightly lower for plant. Now I'm being 
massively generalized there. Um, so if you eat just one plant, you're likely to experience a problem. But if you sample across numerous plants, the complementary profiles of them are likely to make up for each other. Okay. So we've now got a question about helping out the next generation. So uh, have you looked at what the effect of, prote of a protein manipulated diet on the subsequent generation is? Is there a diet that can give the offspring a head start or a healthier, longer lifespan? Right. Good question. No, we haven't. These, um, I haven't done these experiments. Um, I, I have, I co-supervised two PhD students with Damien Dowling and, and we've started to ask these questions. Um, the story gets complicated fast and I'm sure I'm going to mess it up if I try and recite the, um, the students' results. Uh, but it, it basically goes along the lines of if you have two animals with a, a matched diet, so they've got a similar sort of diet and two animals on a mismatched diet, so one's diet restricted and one's fully fed, uh, you get different outcomes in the offspring. Where it looks as though the two animals, I hope I've got this right, <laughs> that have come from parents who have got matched diets tend to be better prepared for that diet in terms of their lifespan outcomes. But if they're mismatched, there's no gain anymore and they've lost that benefit. And that's all I'm going to say on that because I don't want to mess it up. And uh, we'll be, <laughs> I guess that's one of those things that I should say. You should look out for the published work of Damien Dowling. So preliminary would be eat the food that's going to be good for your children. Right, exactly. And make sure your partner does too. Okay. <laughs> um, so we're, I, there are quite a few questions still to go, but I'm, I'm conscious that we're running out of time. So I'm, maybe we'll step back a bit further. Okay. So is there an interaction between uh, diet and uh, an ongoing climate change in terms of how the food we have access to and the environment in which we live mm -hmm. might alter life expectancy? Yeah, I, I think, good question. So at a fundamental level, I mean, I think there's some evidence that um, as CO2 levels rise, the macronutrient ratio in crops can change. Uh, and one of the effects there is that protein can get diluted out of grains. Uh, and so there's some evidence that at least that there's a protein dilution effect, at least at that level. I mean, human nutrition is so complex because uh, uh, we have social factors involved and commercial interests involved. Uh, and, and so they sort of uh, mediate a, a very muddy water between us and our dietary nutrition. That's another reason why we like working with flies. Uh, but I, but it, th there is evidence that the macronutrient proportions in plants can change as a result of increasing CO2 levels. Well, perhaps that's a good place to leave it. Yeah, that, that is a nice, expansive, difficult question for us to end with. Yeah. Um, so I will... I believe I'm handing back over to Udi now, but before I do that, I will thank Matt for a wonderful talk. There are some thanks rolling through as well. Right. Um, and I will add my thanks to everyone uh, for joining us. It's really nice to see so many people who've hung through um, and who came and gave up some of their evening to hear us talk um, and particularly to hear Matt. Great. Um, and if you do have other questions, um, feel free to look Matt Piper up. I'm Craig White. Um, you can flick them through. We're always happy to engage with anyone who's interested in science. Absolutely. And with that, I'll pass on to Udi. Great. Thanks for your time. Bye. Great. Thank you, Craig and Matt. Now, that was quite an interesting presentation. Uh, look, we have had a um, lot of questions still unanswered. What I might do is at the end of the session, pass on some of the questions to Matt and then um, if, um, uh, if you can actually find your email from your username, we'll try and email you um, the answers if you can. Um, look, thank you all for joining us this evening, and I hope you all enjoyed the talk. Um, what I would ask you is at the end of the session, I will share you, with you the recording of this webinar. So feel free to share it with your family, your colleagues, whoever's quite interested in, in this, area, this topic or in childs in general, we are happy for you to share it with uh, anyone who's passionate. Um, the one thing I'd ask you is to actually uh, uh, provide me with the feedback for our webinars. I will send you a feedback survey just in the same email. Uh, it will really inform what sort of topics are of interest to your alumni and also it will 
sort of inform us back if this is beneficial and also if there are any improvements that we need to make in this space. Um, so I thank you all. Thank you, Craig and Matt, for a brilliant webinar. Um, I hope you all enjoy this evening. Well, have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye.